There's a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, written by a, an English monk in the 14th century, but it's based on another book called Theologia Mystica, which was written in the 6th century by an unknown Syrian monk who used the name of Dionysius the Areopagite. And absolutely fascinating, very short little book, which I translated long ago, back in 1943, and I'm about to reissue it. But this book ends up with a description of God, which is all in negatives. Not any kind of anything you can imagine at all. Not light, not power, not spirit, not fatherhood, not sonship, not uh, this, that and the other. All the way down the line. Everything that anybody's ever said or thought about God is denied. Because God is infinite and therefore beyond the reach of any conception at all. So he says that anybody who having a vision thought he saw God would not have seen God but some creature that God has made that is less than God. So again, you approach in a Christian context, said in such a way that even St. Thomas Aquinas bought it, <laughs> that you can't impute heresy to it, because everybody's got to agree that God is the witch than which there is no witcher, and this guy spells it out. Part 1 of The Divine Darkness Thou Trinity beyond being, Thou Godhead and most perfect guardian of the divine wisdom of Christians, direct us to the height of mystical revelation, sublime beyond all thought and light, wherein the simple, absolute, and immutable mysteries of divine truth are hidden in the translucent darkness of that silence, which revealeth in secret. For this darkness, though of deepest obscurity, is yet radiantly clear, and Though beyond touch and sight, it overfills our unseeing minds with splendors of transcendent beauty. This is my prayer. As for you, beloved Timothy, exerting yourself sincerely in mystical contemplation, quit the senses, the workings of the intellect, and all that may be sensed and known, and all that is not and is, for by this you may unknowingly attain, in as far as it is possible, to the oneness of Him who is beyond all being and knowledge. Thus, through indomitable, absolute, and pure detachment of yourself from all things, you will be lifted up to that radiance of the divine darkness, which is beyond being, surpassing all, and free from all. But take heed lest the profane hear those, I say, who cling to creatures, and imagine in themselves that nothing is beyond being beyond existences, but suppose themselves to know him who maketh darkness his hiding place. If, then, the divine mysteries are beyond such, what shall be said of those yet more profane who conceive the underlying cause of all in terms of the outward forms of things, and assert that he exceeds not these impious and manifold conceits of their own making? In so far as he is the cause of all things, we must needs impute and affirm of him all their attributes. But in so far as he is beyond and above all, we must needs deny those attributes to him entirely. Yet not suppose that in this affirmation and denial are contradictory, but that he himself is before and above all denials and beyond all negating and imputing. After this manner, then, the blessed Bartholomew says that divine truth is both much and very little, and the gospel both wide and great, and yet brief. This seems to me a marvelous insight, for the excellent cause of all things may be revealed with many words, with few words, and with even no words, inasmuch as he is both unutterable and unknowable, because beyond being he stands above all nature. He is truly revealed without coverings only to those who pass above all things impure and pure, who go beyond all climbing of sacred heights and leave behind all heavenly lights and sounds and supernatural discourses and are taken up into that darkness where, as the scripture says, he truly is who is beyond all things. 
for not unmeaningly was the blessed Moses himself first bidden to be purified, and then to be set aside from the unpurified. And after entire purification he heard the many-voiced trumpets, and beheld a multitude of lights, giving forth pure and manifold beams. After he was set aside from the many folk, he went before the elect priests to the uttermost peak of spiritual heights. But thus far he had not yet conversed with God himself, nor beheld him, for he is without aspect, but saw only the place where he dwells. This I take to mean that the most heavenly and lofty of things which may be seen and known are no more than certain images of things subordinate to him, who transcends all. Through them is shown his presence, exceeding all comprehension, standing on those heights of his holy places which may be known of the mind. And at times he who is set free of things seen and of things seeing enters into the truly mystical darkness of unknowing, wherefrom he puts out all intellectual knowledge and cleaves to that which is quite beyond touch and sight, the entire essence of him who is beyond all. Thus through the voiding of all knowledge, he is joined in the better part of himself, not with any creature, nor with himself, nor with another, but with him who is inwardly unknowable, and in knowing nothing, he knows beyond the mind. Part two, in what manner must we needs be united with God? and of the praise of the Maker of all things, who is above all. We long exceedingly to dwell in this translucent darkness, and through not seeing and not knowing to see and to know Him who is beyond both vision and knowledge by the very fact of neither seeing Him nor knowing Him, for this is truly to see and to know. I heard this in the Upanishads. Anyway. And through the abandonment of all things, to praise him who is beyond and above all. For this is not unlike the art of those who hew out a lifelike image from stone, removing from around it all which impedes clear vision of the latent form, showing its true hidden beauty solely by taking away. For it is, as I believe, more fitting to praise him by taking away than by ascription. For we ascribe attributes to him when we start from universals and come down through the intermediate to particulars. But here we take away all things from him, going up from particulars to universals, that we may know openly the unknowable, which is hidden in and under all things that may be known, and we behold that darkness beyond being, concealed under all natural light. I swear I'm reading a book on Zen. No, it's Christianity. Part 3. What may be affirmed of divine truth, and what denied? In the theological outlines, we have praised those things which fitly pertain to the theology of affirmation. How the divine and excellent nature may be spoken of as one, and how as three, how in accord therewith the fatherhood of God may be explained, how the sonship, and in what manner the truth of the Spirit may be revealed, how out of the incorporeal and undivided excellence they put forth these three interior lights of goodness, and how in himself, and in themselves, and in their mutual and co-eternal propagation, they remain together, nowhere going apart. How Jesus, while above all creation, may be in very truth of the substance of human nature, and whatsoever else that is set forth in Scripture we have explained in the theological outlines, and in the book of the Divine Names, we have told how he may be called good, being, life, wisdom, and power, and whatsoever else concerns the spiritual naming of God. In the symbolic theology, we have told what divine names may be taken from things of sense, as well as what divine forms, figures, members, instruments, heavenly places, and realms may be spoken of in terms of sensible images. We have also explained such other terms as are used as symbolic forms and sacred figures of the image of God, e.g. in the Old Testament. To wit the divine anger, sorrow, hatred, and inebriation, and abandon, the swearing, cursing, sleeping, and waking. I think, too, that you have understood how the discussion of particulars is more lengthy than of universals, for it was fitting that the theological outlines and the treatise of the divine names 
may be less wordy than the symbolic theology. For the more we aspire to higher things, the more our discourse upon things of the intellect is cut short. Even as, when we enter that darkness which passes understanding, we shall find not brevity of speech, but perfect silence and unknowing. Is this Ramana Maharshi? No, it's Christianity. Herein speech descends from the universal to the particular, and as it descends, it is increased in proportion to the multiplicity of things. But now, in truth, it ascends from the particular to the universal, and going up is withdrawn as it rises, and after the whole ascent it becomes inwardly silent, entirely united with the ineffable. But for what reason, you ask, do we ascribe as the divine attributes of things universal and begin our negations concerning the divinity from things particular? Because in ascribing to that which is beyond all attributes which are more fitting to him, it is proper to ascribe things abstract. But in taking away attributes from him who is beyond all privation, we take away what is truly most remote from him. For is he not more truly life and goodness than air and stone? And, on the other hand, is he not more truly remote from dissipation and anger than he is unspoken and unthought? Part 4. That he partakes not of sensible things who is preeminently their maker. We say, therefore, that the transcendent maker of all things lacks neither being, nor life, nor reason, nor mind. Yet he has no body, neither has he form, nor image, nor quality, nor quantity, nor bulk. He is in no place, nor is he seen, nor has he sensible touch, nor does he feel, nor is he felt, nor has he confusion and tumult nor disturbance of material passions. Neither is he without power, succumbing to the contingencies of sensible things. Neither is his light in any deficiency, nor change, nor corruption, nor division, nor lack, nor flux. Nor is he, nor has he any other sensible thing. Part 5. That he partakes not of intelligible things who is preeminently their maker. Going yet higher, we say that he is neither a soul, nor a mind, nor an object of knowledge. Neither has he opinion, nor reason, nor intellect. Neither is he reason, nor thought, nor is he utterable, or knowable. Neither is he number, order, greatness, littleness, equality, inequality, likeness, nor unlikeness. Neither does he stand nor move. Neither is he quiescent. Neither has he power, nor is power, nor light. Neither does he live, nor is life. Neither is he being, nor eternity, nor time, nor is his touch knowable. Neither is he knowledge, nor truth, nor kingship, nor wisdom, nor one, nor oneness, nor divinity, nor goodness. Neither is he spirit, as we can understand it, nor sonship, nor fatherhood nor any other thing known to us or to any other creature. Neither is he of things which are not, nor of things which are. Neither do the things which understand him as he is in himself, nor does he himself understand them as existing in themselves. Neither is there utterance of him, nor name, nor knowledge. Neither is he darkness, nor light, nor falsehood, nor truth. Neither is there any entire affirmation or negation that may be made concerning him. But on the other hand, we make affirmations and denials of those things which are less than him, and follow from him. But of himself we neither affirm nor deny anything, since he who is beyond all attributes is perfect and alone the cause of all, beyond all negation, the height of that which is entirely free from all and beyond all.